Happy New Year's. Today we are celebrating, because it's Sunday, we have gospel on the go, and we are celebrating the naming of, of, of the Lord. Um, and I'm going to share with you some scripture and some prayers and a blessing and a sermon and pray that this is going to be a beautiful year for you and a beautiful day. And Gospel on the Go is in transition because I moved my office around recently and I've lost the wall. <laughs> I've lost it that I used to use as a backdrop. So, um, and during Advent, I was using our dining room as a, and living room as the backdrop. So I have yet to find the the new home for Gospel on the Go. So you have the home for Church at Home with Rachel for today's worship. So I invite you to get comfortable, um, to be present, and we will we'll say some prayers and some scripture, and then I'll share with you a sermon. We begin with the Collect for Dayspring Ministries, which is the community um, that I serve as the priest. Sorry, having said already, my name is Rachel Parker. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm the priest or the rector, the minister for Dayspring Ministries, which is the collect we're going to use in a second. And when that's um, St. Mary's in Edgerton, St. Saviour's in Vermilion, and St. Thomas in, in Wainwright, um, three small towns in the Diocese of Edmonton in the Anglican Church of Canada. We're located in the province of Alberta. So glad to have you here. Uh, let us Let us pray. Creator God, you have commissioned us to be bearers of light to your world. As you have given to us the day spring who is Jesus Christ our Lord, so encourage us to share him with all whom we meet. Allow us the privilege and the responsibility to carry the light of your day spring into the communities in which we live, work, and play, the communities you call us to serve. With your Holy Spirit's presence and guidance, may our work as day spring ministries bring hope, peace, and joy to your world. In the name of the day spring, who is Jesus our Lord, we pray. Amen. And this is the collect for the octave day of Christmas and the circumcision of Christ be New Year's Day. And that's the wording from the Book of Common Prayer. So let us pray. Almighty God, who has given us thy only begotten Son to take our nature upon him, and as at this time be born of a pure virgin, grant that we, being regenerate and made thy children by adoption and grace, may daily be renewed by thy Holy Spirit, through the same our Lord Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the same Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who madest thy blessed Son to be circumcised and obedient to the law for man, grant us the true circumcision of the Spirit, that our hearts and all our members, being mortified from all worldly and carnal lusts, we may in all things obey thy blessed will, through the same thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O immortal Lord God, who inhabitest eternity, and hast brought thy servants to the beginning of another year, pardon, we humbly beseech thee, our transgressions in the past. Bless to us this new year, and graciously abide with us all the days of our life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So that was the collect for the day, the collect for the circumcision of Jesus, and the collect for the new year. And I'd like to share with you three three short um, passages from the Old Testament, the Psalm, and the New Testament, and then the Gospel, of course. So this is a reading from Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 22 to 27. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the Israelites. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. And this is the 29th Psalm. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name, worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters, the God of glory thunders, the Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful, the voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars, the Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf, and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. 
The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare, and in his temple all say, Glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. And a reading from the letter of Paul to the Galatians, chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And this is the gospel from the second chapter of Luke, verses 15 to 21. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. The Gospel of Christ. Praise be to thee, O Christ. I speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we are halfway through Christ, the Christmas season. We will soon mark the twelfth of the twelve days of Christmas. We begin our preparations for the celebrations and season of Epiphany when we recognize the arrival of the wise men at Jesus' home, and more significantly, we mark our recognition of the arrival and presence of the deity, Jesus, the Son of God, not as a child born in Bethlehem, but as a real and certain presence in our own lives. Today we celebrate the naming of Jesus, one step closer to the season of Epiphany, a season which bridges the time between Christmas and Lent. We focus on Jesus' presence as a man working miracles in our lives. We listen to stories to make those connections between ourselves and this man, Jesus, whom God has given us as a friend, a mentor, a confidant, and teacher. The season of Epiphany is really, in many ways, about life in normal times. We follow Jesus' journey from childhood and watch as he comes of age and is ready to take on the responsibility which God has chosen for him as he moves into his 30th year. But before we move into these regular times, we have a few last days to play. We have a few more chances for celebrating the miraculous, the wondrous, that which would be magical if it were not divine. We have a couple more days to romp in the Christmas spirit, playing with the baby Jesus and reveling in that Christmas belief that anything could happen. In many homes around the world, Christmas trees are adorned with lights and decorations and ribbons and bright, colorful items. But in some of these homes, the tree doesn't arrive until Christmas Eve, and it doesn't come down until January 6, Epiphany. I used to wonder about that particular practice because in my family, we always put the tree up on December 12th, my sister's birthday, and took it down on either January 1st or 2nd, depending upon who would be home to help. It wasn't until I became a priest that I began to understand the importance for many of not putting up the tree until Christmas and then leaving it up until January 6th. At first I thought it was just because the weeks way heading up to, to Christmas were so very busy. Putting the tree up early would require being home and having the right attitude for such a joyous ritual. For a priest, that can be a difficult combination to find any time before Christmas Eve. However, as I continued to listen to the Advent stories and prayed about what Christmas and its official 12 days are for, I began to understand. The short but incredibly moving season between Christmas Eve and Epiphany is one of great uniqueness. It is a span of 12 days that are so moving in their meaning, so rich in their possibilities, that having a large, colorful, glorious tree in the middle of your living room reminds you of what is actually happening in this season of Christmas. In some cultures, the Christmas tree would not be seen until after the midnight mass on Christmas Eve. 
When the children got home from church, they would go into the parlor or living room and there would be a tree, tall, sparkling, candles lit, and beautiful ornaments. The tree was the first of their Christmas miracles. The angels had brought it for them while they were worshiping and celebrating the birth of the baby Jesus. In one case, the children came home to find the patio doors blown open with little angel footprints in the snow and a few feathers stuck in the bushes. With the miraculous appearance of the tree began the season filled with many miracles. The placement of a miraculous tree on Christmas Eve is only a symbol of all that could happen for God's creation during those 12 days. While children have grown to give Santa the credit, presents nevertheless arrive beneath that tree on Christmas morning. For some, a gift is given for each of the 12 days of Christmas. For many, Christ's Christmas becomes the time for forgiveness when families come together, possibly out of tradition or duty, but find it in the gathering peace, love, hope, and joy. For some, Christmas is a, is a time of hurt and pain. They remember Christmas's past and think of those who are no longer with them. However, in the Christmas story, in the progression from Bethlehem to the naming of Jesus, to the presentation of the child at the temple, to the appearance of the wise men, there is a journey offered which can bring healing and new hope to those who are in sorrow and pain. Regardless of how you approach the season of Christmas, there is embodied in it new life, and with that new life comes new hope, new belief, new faith. And with that new hope, belief, and faith comes something even more miraculous than a beautiful Christmas tree or the renewal of family ties. With the Christmas season comes the sure and certain knowledge that miracles are in the air. The first miracle of Christmas is, of course, the birth of the baby Jesus. It is of great importance that this is where we start. The first miracle, the first focus of Christmas, is upon a child. You see, Christmas is really just for children. All you have to do is look around at the excitement at kids at this time of the year to know that they do have a real grasp on what's happening. They don't worry about the MasterCard bills that will come in January. They don't worry over a burnt turkey in the oven. They don't even aren't even panicking about that big hole in the Christmas tree that no amount of, of turning can hide. Children just have a sense that something big is in the air, and they don't even try to take the and don't even try to take the wind out of their sails. We can learn an important lesson from kids at this time of year. Faith in the impossible becomes possible. Children have vivid imaginations. They can create anything in their minds, and up to a certain age, that creation in their minds is as real as if it were sitting in front of them sit down with a child before they hit that age when they start to become conscious of the world around them and ask them what they want to be when they grow up. When I was five, I wanted to be a ballerina, a doctor, a cowboy, a mother, and nurse all at the same time. Nothing you could say would convince me that I couldn't grow up and become all of these because all I had to do was go to the playroom and pick up my play medical bag and I was a doctor. Or give me a cowboy hat and a broomstick and I was John Wayne taming the Wild West. Anything was possible because I believed it was all possible. When children are still believing in the possibility of everything and anything, they are closer to God than you could possibly get because they get it. They understand the almost invisible line between it's a miracle and of course that happened. When kids are at that stage in life when Christmas is all it is meant to be, they are also at that stage in life when they could become, and who's to say they don't become, co-creators of reality with God. When God created this world, when he spoke our universe and our earth and our humanity into being, he didn't sit down and think to himself, I could do that, but it's not really feasible. He didn't sit down to sketch out a map of the world and say, that wouldn't work because it's just my imagination. It's not real. He sat down the way a child would sit down and he just started imagining. With no limits to his creativity, look what he gave us. Only one who does not put limits on miracles, only one who does not say it can't happen, 
could give us a child, his own son, who would do the unimaginable and take our humanity upon himself, one who needed to be named as God's own son, just as we do. From his fullness we have all received grace. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. This season of Christmas brings us closer to God because God has brought himself closer to us. This divine being, the almighty and everlasting God who lives somewhere up there, came down to be with us in the form of a baby. He who is closest to God is close to us because he, like any child, understands just how close we are to God through him. This baby Jesus in whom we have invested so much has taught us that miracles are not out of reach. He has taught us that if we believe, if we have a child's faith in his Father, and if we place our trust in him and accept his will, then miracles are sure to follow. Imagine what would happen if every Christian took the opportunity in these last days of Christmas to pray for peace. Imagine what could happen if we were all to pray for God's will to be done in the world instead of praying for victory over Name your threat. Imagine as a child would what a miracle would look like if, instead of praying solely for health in an ailing body, we were to pray for a miracle in the soul. Imagine what a miracle would look like if every person who prayed to an end to homelessness and hunger were to open their cupboards and their homes to another. This season of Christmas began with a miracle that was so far-fetched, so absolutely inconceivable, that people still don't really get it yet today. God has given us the gift of miracles every day, but we may not see them because we are so focused on what couldn't possibly happen. This 12 days which we are living in should be a visible reminder for us that something great can come where nothing was before. Just as our living rooms are transformed for a short while by the beauty and joy of a decorated tree, maybe our lives could be transformed permanently if we were to take the example of that child born 2,000 years ago and just accept in our hearts that miracles are not just possible, they are downright probable. We just have to learn to stop limiting God's imagination when it comes to our lives and our world. Amen. I invite you to to take some time, if you wish to turn the video on, put it on pause for a moment, and just pray for those people in your life, the situations you live in, your politicians, your community, your neighbors, your church, or the people that you hang out with. Whatever church might look like for you, it might not be a Sunday thing. It could be the people you go and talk to on Monday at Starbucks or the people you go and do jujitsu with or whoever it is that is your community. I invite you to take some time to pray for them as we pray for our community here at Day Spring Ministries. In our biddings this day, we remember our world, the church, our people, ourselves. For all countries struggling with health conditions, for climate crises around the world, for all whose homes and lives are threatened, and for all who are working to create new ways of being that we might be better stewards of God's creation. For peace and hope in our world, remembering all members of our Canadian Armed Forces, especially those stationed at Garrison Wainwright, and for the chaplaincy services here, for Padres Rob, Dan, Tony, Eduardo, Balum, and Bogus. For the Church, we uphold the Anglican Church of Canada, the leadership of our churches, Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Linda, our primate, Stephen, our bishop, and we remember La Iglesia Anglicana de Mexico. For the National Indigenous Bishop-elect Chris Harper and the staff of Indigenous Ministries, for the Anglican Council of Indigenous People, for Bishop Michael Price, the people and rostered ministers of the Eastern Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada, for the ministries of the Council of the North and the Diocese of Saskatchewan, 
for the diocese of Moussigny, the most reverend Anne Germond, archbishop and metropolitan in the ecclesiastical province of Ontario, for the most reverend Fred Hiltz, assisting bishop, for the retired clergy of the diocese of Edmonton, Michael Lawson, Joyce Meller, Elizabeth Metcalf, Charles Mortimer, Anne-Marie Nicklin, Helen Northcott, Susan Ormsby, William Patterson, Bob Peel, Jim Plambeck, David Prouse, Paul Robinson. For the Bouye Synod Office, for Simeon Kanono, Christian Education Coordinator and Bible College Director, for Nahimi Mbonyim Pano, the diocesan typist, for Amos Mutizimana, Evangelism Officer, for Noel Ntamak Vukukiro, Gender-Based Violence and, and Peace and Reconciliation Officer. We pray for the people of Paul First Nation. For our partner parishes of Bagambo and Dayspring Ministries, St. Mary's Edgerton, St. Saviour's Vermilion, and St. Thomas in Wainwright. And for our siblings in Christ at Church of the Nativity, Frog Lake First Nation, and their lay reader in charge, Fred Matthews. And we pray for all those who have asked us for prayer. Ben and Gail, Kathy and Drew, Dawn, Hilda, Janiah, Katie, Rob, Roz, Ruth, Stephen, Taylor, Wanda, and all those we now name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Lord, have mercy upon them, and may they recognize your peace and feel your hope washing over them. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. And now, um, just a couple of quick announcements for those people who are in the Dayspring Ministries area. Uh, next week, we will be celebrating the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord on January 8th. And we will have Eucharist at all three churches because uh, my husband, Padre Rob Parker, will be present in Edgerton and Vermilion, or in Wainwright to uh, celebrate Eucharist. And I'll be in Vermilion. On um, January the 29th, we will be having a joint worship service at 1030 at St. Thomas in Wainwright. And members of all three congregations and anyone else are welcome to join us. And in, you're invited to bring a potluck contribution because we will join together for our first joint um, service since we began Day Spring Ministries. And just a reminder that we are also coming up into our annual general meetings um, season of the year. And so if you are a member of one of those three churches and you are involved in any way in the church, um, a warden, a treasurer, an envelope secretary, uh, you lead a study or an ACW group, just a reminder that we need your your um, reports for the annual reports. I need them about three weeks or more before the meeting. So I need, in the next two weeks, I need the reports from St. Thomas in Wainwright. In the next three weeks, I need them from Edgerton. In the next month, I need them from Vermilion because we are staggering our services. I really do hope that you have a blessed new year and I pray that you will recognize the peace of Christ in all that you do as you move forward. And in just one second, I will share with you a blessing. Here we go. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Have a blessed day. I will be back tomorrow, January 2nd, for, for Church at Home with Rachel, and next Sunday for Gospel on the Go for the Baptism of the Lord. May you have a blessed week and a happy new year. Thanks for joining me today. God bless.